talking to you. Amen. Talking to you from John 1, 17. Amen. Woo! Hey. Woo or maybe you should go back a little further. 117 is good. But I think around 115 it says grace for grace. Pastor Nancy, you can read it for me. I can read it, yeah. Yeah. Pastor Shirley was great Thursday night. I know some of you were out to a big meeting over in Bedford, but I encourage you to uh, to go and listen. Not because he picked on Pastor Paul; she picked on Pastor Paul. I thoroughly enjoyed that, but it had nothing to do with that. It had to do with she preached. In my estimation, it was the best message she ever preached in her life. Nice, amen. And what I like about her is. Who you see is who you get. Amen. Like surely sweet, innocent, totally honest. <laughs> she's going to say what she's thinking. And mostly she's been very good with Pastor Paul, but on Thursday she uh, found her groove. <laughs> the anointing was strong. <laughs> But you need to hear it because you need to know what they, like, their testimony is amazing. Yes. Like, even when we made Pastor Paul to be pastor, Shirley was thinking, how could you make him be a pastor? Yeah. Like, no, because it took a long while for her to walk into that place of forgiveness, yeah. that she had to learn that, that she had to learn that God forgave him, but I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, but now to look at you guys, like you're a living, walking, breathing testimony of the goodness of God. Yes. You know, I, I read what the Apostle Paul went through, and I'm reading what my life looks like, and I'm thinking, Paul, you need to apologize to me, man. Some of the crap I've been through in my lifetime. <laughs> Are you saying you're comparing yourself with Pastor Paul, with with uh, the Apostle Paul? Yeah. Yeah, you need to do it too. It, I started thinking about everybody in this room. Everyone in this room has got a powerful, powerful story. Amen. And the most powerful part is you're here. Yes, sir. Amen. You had so many opportunities to quit like the Apostle Paul did, yeah. but you, like him, you didn't do it. You didn't do it. You didn't do it. You're still here. Still here. Amen. You know, but you need to give yourself a pat on the back oh, because... Yeah. If Christianity was, you know, we walk by faith and not by sight. And we love reading Hebrews chapter 11, the highlight reel. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. But when you read their back story, you find out they were just like us. Yes, right. Yeah. They have a highlight reel. They've got about two hours of their life that was really great. <laughs> and the rest, the rest was suck it up and keep going, boy. <laughs> that's true. You, but you need to know that. You need to know that, hey, we're walking this out, and I do have a highlight reel. I am written in Hebrews chapter 11. That's right. Yes, you are. Your, your name is there, written in the Lamb's book of life. How do you know that? He tells us in Hebrews 12, 1. He says to cast aside every weight, the sin that so easily besets us, and walk with patience the race that's been set before us. You get a race that's been set before you, and you stumble and you fall. Yep. Oh, yeah. And you stumble and you fall. Oh, yeah. yes. And you yeah. stumble and you fall. And, you get up again. and sometimes you crawl. Yeah. That's right. yeah. But you don't quit. You don't cave in. No, he said you'd. Re he said, "Be not deceived." Come on, Hebrews, uh, Galatians six seven. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Yep. And sometimes you don't sow good stuff. But he said if you keep sowing the good stuff, you reap in due season. Due season was last week. Wasn't it? Yeah. No one. It's supposed to be. <laughs> We're walking toward due season. But he said you'll get there and if you don't quit and if you don't cave in. So I don't know what you've been through to get to where you are today to arrive on 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 this at this address today, but keep going. Yes. Yeah, keep going. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
Like I can sleep every night of the week except Saturday night. Getting ready to preach on Sunday. Yeah. Waking up all hours of the night. None of this stuff ever happens to you. No. I'm just saying, when, you, when, you, when you're going through things, go through things. Amen. He said, in me you'll have peace. peace. And if he had to stop there, it would have been good. Yeah. But he didn't. he didn't. He said, in the world you have tribulation. tribulation. I mean, if you know, tribulation sucks. <laughs> And then to top it off, he says, but be of good cheer. <laughs> oh, yeah, I really feel like laughing right now. <laughs> be of good cheer. I've overcome the world for you. James 1, verse 2. Count it all joy. When's the last time you did that, though? Count it all joy. Hey, come on over to my place. I'm having a party. Why? Because everything sucks in my life right now. <laughs> Count it all joy when you fall into. You weren't even planning on it. When you fall into divers, temptations, tests, and trials. Say it with me. Temptation. No, don't. <laughs> Test. <laughs> trial. Developing patience. <laughs> no, not the trial of your faith. No, that's not, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of it, aren't I? That, <laughs> Test and trials. Knowing that the trial of your faith will work. That favorite word in the Bible, patience. And after patience has its perfect work. Has anybody ever prayed for patience? I did early, early on. It didn't take long to realize I'm never going to do that again. Any bad thing that could ever happen after you pray for patience, God's saying, okay, I'll get you some. All hell will break loose in your favor. One way to get it. <laughs> Let patience have its perfect work that you be complete, entire. Lacking in what? Nothing. But that's where, that's where we are today. Really, you're lacking nothing right now. Really, your best day, and we keep saying that, the reason why we keep saying that your best days are up ahead is because that's what we believe. Amen. We really believe, Haggai 2, 6 to 9. Pastor Nancy, could you read that? Oh, I'm in John 1. Did you want me to read that? Psalm 1. 17. John 1. No, no, go to... Go to go. Go to Haggai chapter 2 and verses 6 to 9 first. We'll get back to John 7, 1, 17. Haggai 2, 6 to 9 is the hour that you're living in right now. It's like reading the newspaper today. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Keep going Seven. tonight. And Let's I go. will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Like just just this past week, we um, we got a hold of Ed Dixon. How many of you know who Ed Dixon is? <laughs> Ed Dixon's been in the Ukraine for. Oh, I'm not going to tell you his whole story. Just to say this that he he's been in in Ukraine for years, and we've gone over and preached for him a, a couple of times, and preached for we preached to the Russian military. And when we see what's going on right now, we understand it completely how Putin screwed them up and all of that and how they don't they don't like him. And so we were part we are part of all that. But what we learned there, what we learned in in those days was that um well our, we what I bought a church. I bought a church 
Pastor Victor had a church in uh, in out, outside Kivoy Rogue. We bought it. I bought it on my visa card for. I, I I went to one of the meetings and I said, I through the interpreter I said, "What's going on with Pastor Victor?" And uh, the girl spoke and came back and said, "He's losing his church. He can't pay the mortgage." So I said, "How much is his mortgage?" Twelve hundred dollars. I said, "Do they take visa?" <laughs> paid for his church. Paid for a church with my credit card. Yeah. And then he was looking at a lot next door. And I said, how much do you want for that lot next door, to, next to the school, so they could maneuver himself near the schoolyard? 150 bucks. So I bought a church and a lot, the lot next door for, uh, for 1,350 bucks. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Then I came back here to the to the congregation and told the congregation, and they paid off my credit card. Well, why am I telling you that now? Because I I contacted uh, I contacted the pastor over there again. I said I want to I want to help Pastor Victor. What can I do? They said, Well, he's uh, he he needs a hundred and eighty thousand hundred hundred eighty bucks a month. Two eighty. Two uh, two hundred eighty two hundred and eighty dollars a month to to stay in operation. He's reaching. He's reaching hundreds of people now. That church that we bought, that this church bought over there, is ministering to hundreds and hundreds of people. So I, I, I contacted Ed Dix. I said, I, I want to help. I want to help Pastor, Pastor Victor. What can we do? He said, well, for 280 bucks a month, you can run him debt-free and give him enough money to minister all over the, all over the area that he's in. So we... You are now hooked up to him for two hundred and eighty dollars a month. Yeah, but I mean, two hundred and eighty bucks a month here wouldn't get you very far, but over there, yeah. it takes you all the way home, man. Yeah, man. So when you pay your tithes and your offerings, you got to know that that we've got it activated out there. Yeah, we've got people that are being blessed out there. You know, so read the list of people that we bless every month and be encouraged. Now, where does it say John 1, 17? Yeah, but you really, I think you really need to read verse 14. And the Word was made flesh. Mm, that's Jesus. Yeah. The Word was made Jesus. <laughs> and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of what? Grace and truth. Grace no, but most truth. of the church doesn't even know that. Yeah. The church is still the judgmental God out there yes. coming to get you. He came to get you with grace and truth. Continue reading. John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace, grace for grace grace for grace verse 17 for the law was given by Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ the law came through Moses and so many of the church world live under that law yeah. not realizing that we're, we're, we're not under the Amen. law Matter of fact, we've been redeemed from the curse of the Lord Christ being made a curse for us that the blessing of Abraham would come upon us. Yes. So we're living in this this amazing grace. People are still stuck under the law of Moses. Yeah. The law came. All you need to, to if you if you just read Galatians 3.24, it says that, it, no, it says the, the law is our schoolmaster. So the law, when you read the, the law, what it's supposed to tell you is you can't do this. Stop trying to do this. Stop trying. Stop trying and dying. Stop trying to live that. The schoolmaster, 
the schoolmaster, the school teacher says, you can't do this. You can't keep the Ten Commandments. Matter of fact, you can't even get through this whole day today without messing up. It'll be real, let, let, try, unless you go home and go to bed and, and go to sleep, you won't make it through the day. But when you understand the grace and the truth, grace and truth came by Jesus. Well, the truth of the word has to be mixed with the grace of the word. You have to understand, you can't just have grace because I can do whatever I want now. But you can't have truth and be bound by that either. You've got to have the grace and the truth working together. Grace and truth by Jesus. Amen. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and full of truth. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth. Everybody say grace and truth. Grace. I live by grace and in truth. Hallelujah. And I'm not the change agent. I'm being changed from glory to glory to the image of his son. Hallelujah. That's Corinthians 3.18. We are being changed from glory to glory to the image of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, it means you accept the things that you cannot change. You change the things that you can, and you have the wisdom to know the difference. <laughs> right? That's what they taught us in AA. I remember walking into AA, and there was a sign on the desk, and it said, this too shall pass. Amen. That's all I needed at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. That was it. Grace and truth. Hallelujah. It's just too bad that the people that we sat with never ever got yeah. the truth. Yeah. Like I met people in, in AA that were, oh man, my family's coming home. Yeah. Been sober for 10 years. Yeah. Freaking out because the family's coming home because they, they never ever got free. Never got free. And I knew the difference. One day I was working in a, a restaurant behind the bar which is funny how it ended up going into those places after I got saved. Yeah. I'm in behind a bar and uh, working on a bar machine, which I had to, which I was being paid to fix. Yeah. And the guy comes over and asks for a drink. I poured him a drink and gave it to him. Yeah. Took his money, put it in the cash. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I thought, wow, I see the difference. And I noticed the big difference between me and the other guys in AA. I was free. Amen. I was free. Yeah. You, the son is set free, free is free indeed. I don't, I don't need that anymore. I don't want that anymore. Amen. I've been totally delivered. Same thing with cigarettes. I mean, cigarettes, my, my. Yeah. Yeah. I threw them out, my, out the car window in the morning, and in the afternoon I'd be digging through the grass finding them. <laughs> Time and time again, I threw away the cigarettes. Time and time again, I went and bought them again. And then one day, as God would have it, just takes it away. But the thing was, and the thing I like to point out is, when I first got saved, I would go to church in the morning and come home and read my Bible and smoke joints in the afternoon. Reading my Bible and smoking joints. What kind of revelation I was getting, I have no idea. <laughs> but I realized afterwards that I was just as much saved then as I am now. Yeah. And so I don't know what stage of life that you're in walking with God, but you're just as saved now as you were back then. He loves you. He's working with you, being changed from glory to glory. Now, religion will jump on you. Yeah. Of course, I didn't tell them I was smoking. Of course, they probably do anyway. You walking around smelling like a joint, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's go to, let's go somewhere else. Did we read the law was given by Moses, grace and truth? Okay. Let's go to Luke 22, 23. 
and 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. Okay, I want to talk about I want to talk about that forgiveness because now we need to go to uh, Matthew 18, verse 22. Because in Mark, you know, Shirley, Pastor Shirley brought this up on on uh, Thursday night, and it's vital. If it, when you stand praying, if you have ought against anybody, forgive them. And when you think about Mark 11, 23 and 24, who is, whosoever say to this mountain be removed, cast a seed, don't do it in your heart, believe the things you say will come to pass, you'll have whatsoever you say, right? Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe and you receive them, you shall have them. Okay, but then it's the next verse. If you have ought against anybody, anybody, you have to forgive them. And forgiveness is such a key thing because it's the first thing that Jesus said on the cross. Not the last thing, not the middle thing. The first thing he said was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So forgiveness, if it was the most important thing that he said on the cross, it's the most important thing for you and I also to forgive people. And it may not be the easiest thing to do, but it's the necessary thing. And even when you think of the word forgive, you look it up in the in the Anglo-Saxon word is to give first. To be the first one to give in. Amen. Yeah. To give it. Yeah. And so how many of you here have something against anybody right now? Could I just see a show of hands? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you go looking. You go look into the Word of God and say, what is the big holdup, Lord? Is there something that we're doing or not doing that's stopping the flow of the Spirit of God? And it's forgiveness. Amen. Holding grudges. I forgive you, but I'm never ever going to forget. When I think about what the Lord forgave me for, Amen. I'm going to hold anything against anybody. Now, maybe, maybe some of you weren't the village idiot like I was. <laughs> but to get forgiveness, <laughs> if you have out against anybody, forgive them. So in uh, Matthew 18, 22, uh, 22, I think. Yeah. yeah. Jesus said unto him, now he's talking to Peter, uh, and he said, Jesus said unto him, he, he should forgive Till seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Yeah, so Jesus, Peter saying, Do I have to forgive do I have to forgive you seven times? And Jesus is saying, No, seventy times seven. And that means something. Seventy times seven is four hundred and ninety. Four hundred and ninety is how many years they were in before they went in captivity. And then they were in captivity for 70 years. And then they came back out and they were in, they, 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 they got another 483 years in, and then Jesus was crucified. They still owe seven years. But the forgiveness is the key. How many times should I forgive? God said, you need to be like me. 70 times seven. 70 times 7. I worked with you for 490 years before I let you go into captivity. Now, you go and do thou likewise. When you stand praying, believe that you've received. When you stand praying, forgive. Let go of that grudge. That your Father in heaven may forgive you. If you don't. But here's the key. He says in... Mark 11, Pastor Shirley brought this up on, on Thursday night. If you don't, he won't. Amen. Now think about it, think about it, think about it. If you don't forgive, he won't forgive. Amen. It's it. I didn't say that, it's in red. Jesus said that. That's why when he took the disciples said, oh, Jesus, teach us how to pray. He said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallelujah. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as 
No, but unforgiveness is crippling the church in North America, totally crippling the church. Not us. So 490 years before captivity, 70 years in captivity. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's not hurt. Just do it and be done with it. <laughs> Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. We're moving in there. And they accepted our agreement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, signed lease. Yeah, but the funny thing about the funny thing about moving into Hooper Lane, they changed the name of the street to Hooper Lane. But what you don't know is that fifty eight years ago I got kicked off of that property and told never to come back. <laughs> fifty eight years later they changed the name of the street to Hooper Lane. Now, I didn't know that when they were giving me the boot. <laughs> 58 years ago. Praise the Lord. You see, we look at time. God doesn't have a watch. He said, to everything, there is a season. Mm -hmm. You can throw your watch up in the air. I've tried it a few times over the years. Mm -hmm. Throw your watch up and say, here, if you could catch this, you'd really help me out a lot. <laughs> None of you have ever been saucy with God, but I have had moments when I was sure he couldn't, he didn't know what time it was. Yeah. And he would always tell me, no, I don't know what time it is. I have a due season, and you're not in it. Oh, oh. <laughs> but you reap a due season if you don't quit, if you don't cave in, if you don't stop complaining. I said, that must have been Pastor Nancy. Lord, that couldn't have been me. I don't complain. <laughs> Let's go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Now, Daniel had been in captivity all that time, and, and now, now he's, he's reading the book of Jeremiah, and he gets a revelation from the book of Jeremiah. Hey, my time is almost up here. And so let's read this. Was it Jeremiah he was reading? Yeah. Anyway, 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon this holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to bring everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks and the street shall be built again in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now the people of the prince that shall, shall come, Antiochus Epiphanes was the guy that was going to come in and destroy everything. And... Um, no one understands, verse 25 again, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, shall come, will be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks, and the street shall be built up again in perilous times. And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince of the Chilcom will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes, I've got a whole teaching on him, and I don't want to get into it. But if you study his life, you'll find out that he was, he was, I guess you'd call him the grandfather of the Antichrist. I've got so much teaching on this, and it would take an hour to get into it. And we used to be able to sit. That's another thing that I've noticed over the years, though. We used to be able to sit and teach Bible for hours and nobody would get disturbed. And these days the attention span is just not there anymore. Like, you know, get it done and get me out of here because I got, I got life to do. Mm -hmm. After three score and two weeks of the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end shall be of the flood. 
Now Antiochus Epiphanes came in, came in and destroyed Jerusalem. Verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the middle of the week he shall cause... Well, that's why you have to talk about Antiochus Epiphanes. Because he came into Jerusalem and uh, just started destroying pigs on the altar. And that's when the Maccabee brothers rose up and killed him at Christmas time. Like if you want, if you want to know the Feast of Hanukkah, it's all about Antiochus Epiphanes being wiped out by the Maccabee brothers. They rose up and they they had enough of him and they they toasted him. Antiochus Epiphanes. I, we preached that one time in a in a hotel at Christmas time, didn't we? No, but we were at, we went we had to go to to a hotel for Christmas because our, we were in between locations, and uh, the only other people were that were in the hotel were the were the. Okay. Hmm? Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses. The place was packed full of them. They were all going up and down the halls, knocking on doors, just practicing. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, we ended up in the pool with a woman, and she started talking about, do you know what Christmas is all about? And I said, yeah. I said, that's when the Maccabee brothers wiped out Antiochus Epiphanes. She looked at me. She backed up. She went along, she was out of the water and gone. <laughs> but that's what happened. Antiochus Epiphanes was a type of the Antichrist, and he had moved into Jerusalem and started slaughtering pigs on the altar. And the Maccabees rose up and said, we had enough of this. And um, so when you, when you think about the Antichrist coming and knowing that he's a type of Antiochus Epiphanes, his end is the same. Like... Like the Jewish people, 490 years they were gone and 70 years of captivity. Now they've been back in for 480 years, 83 years, and then the church came. And their calendar stopped and the halftime show started. And so the Jews still owe seven years on their calendar. And when they do... They're going to have to deal with Antiochus Epiphanes. Mm -hmm. Same type of a story, the Antichrist, and we know the outcome. Okay, let's read on. And he shall confirm the covenant with Benny for one week, and in the middle of the week, same guy, same story, shall, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease from the overspreading abominations. He'll make it desolate. Even the consummation that's determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish their transgression and the sins and the reconciliation. No one understand. It's just too much. Just too much. I can't get into that. It's just too much. Lord have mercy. <laughs> no, seriously. Like, you know, how many of you are going to remember Antiochus Epiphanes after today? <laughs> huh? No, but I mean, there's so much teaching in there. And, uh, and it's vitally important stuff, too, for the hour that we're living in, because the seven, they used up 483 years. And then the halftime show, two show started. So the Hebrew people are still owed seven years for that 490 year time frame. And that's what we call the seven year tribulation period. And it's coming upon us now. But it's not, but if you're, where is it written in Luke, Luke 19? Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled? 21 24? Could you read it? Pass, pass the mic. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations, perplexity, 
the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming upon the earth, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. But verse 27, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When you see these things, see, verse 28 is a key. When you see these things happen, get depressed. When you see these things start to pass, worry. When you see these things start to come to pass, make sure you plug into CNN. They'll straighten you out. It says, when you see these things come to pass, look up. See, if, you, if you're not into the Word of God, you'll look down. Look up. Look up. And lift up your heads. And your redemption, your redemption, your redemption is close. Closer than it was. I used to have a watch for years ago that used to beep every hour. When I first met Nancy, I had this watch that would beep every hour. She said, what do you got that for? I said, it reminds me it's an hour closer to the rapture of the church. That's where we lived back. No, that's where we lived back in the 80s. Right? <laughs> Expecting it to happen at any minute. Matter of fact, there was even a book. I think I told you about the book, 100 Reasons Why the Lord Must Return by 1988. And I have friends that went out and ran their credit cards to the max and everything and said, ah, let the Antichrist pay for it. The whole thing flopped, didn't it? <laughs> they were all paying their debts. <laughs> but, that, but all we knew about them was the rapture. But it's amazing how much of the church world today is still after that. Lord, get me out of here. Instead of go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Lord, I just want you to rapture me down. I've got this. I need to escape. No, you need to man up. Yes. You need to get your stuff together. Yep. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and then shall the end come. Amen. Quit trying to run away. Quit trying to run home. Besides that, if you went home right now, they wouldn't want you there, the way you're acting. <laughs> <laughs> No, but he didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And all that is is fear-based stuff. Yeah. Lord, just get me out of here now. Rapture, rapture. It's amazing when you click on the Christian t the TV channels and how much of it is all rapture-based stuff. Oh, he could come in any minute. Not until you straighten up, you sorry thing. <laughs> Not until you get the gospel. See, if you want to know when he's coming, read Matthew 24, 14. Yeah. This gospel will preach into, into all the earth. He said, you'll preach this gospel into all the earth as a witness unto me, and then shall the end come. Yeah. Preaching the gospel is not, well, you better straighten up, you're going to hell. When I go in the rapture, we're all leaving here. We're going to leave you all behind. Don't you ever hear them preach this stuff? We are getting better. It might not look like it to you, but we are. We're still calling those things that be not as though they were. Somebody read that before we go. Romans 4, 17 to 21. 17 to 21. Romans 4, 17 to 21. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him who has believed, even God who quickens the dead, and calls those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which is spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God, through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And now being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Amen. What he promised is also able to perform. Can you imagine a man 100 years old believing to produce a child? And we think we're walking by faith. 
Oh, one more verse, Galatians 3.29. 3.29, Galatians. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's <laughs> seed, and heirs according to the promise. <laughs> I'm the seed of Abraham, and his blessing rests on me. Amen. I'm the seed of Abraham. I'm not moved by what I see. Jesus has been made a surety, and that's what I believe. I'm the seed of Abraham, and his blessing yes. rests on me. I don't care what it looks like. You might think I'm too old to have a child. I don't know if he's going to make it. The pastor's going to make it. He's still sitting down preaching. He's been doing that for a year right now. Stay tuned. Amen. Amen. I cannot be defeated because I refuse to quit. The only way you can ever, the devil can only, the only way that he can ever defeat you is if you decide to cave in. Read it through your Bible. It's all through the Bible. If you don't quit, you win. If you don't quit, you win. And even if you quit, you win. <laughs> There's no losing with us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you for coming out today. We hope this message has encouraged you in your relationship with the Lord. For more information and ministry resources, we invite you to visit our website at www.newcovenantchurch.ca. We look forward to you joining us next time as we continue to live victoriously.